Last week, we kicked off a brand new sermon series looking at the book of Amos. And last week's message was primarily a message of introduction. Remember, we only covered one verse. And by the way, if you weren't here last week and you missed that introductory message, I would strongly encourage you to go back and watch that online. It would be of great benefit for you to kind of see that, that, that foundation that Pastor Russell laid as we prepare this study. But last week really was about looking at some context, looking at how the, the book is structured, and also some major themes that we're gonna see in the book of Amos. What I wanna do though for just a couple of minutes is give us a quick recap on some of the background and contextual things because I think it will help us, again, to better understand what we're looking at when we study the passage we're gonna look at this morning. So we learned last week that Amos came on the scenes around 760 BC. Now, for a lot of us, as soon as you start putting a BC after the number, it's just like, okay, that was a long time ago. Uh, And yes, it was a long time ago, but it helps us to kind of put things in context when they happen. Now, if we go back a little bit further, which we did last week, we went back all the way till Israel was one united kingdom. And we talked about the united kingdom of Israel before it became the divided kingdom. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Israel as a united kingdom had three kings. And I wanna test your memory if you were here last week. Who was the first king? Saul. Who was the second king? David. Who was the third king? You guys did better than the eight o'clock service. That's really good. That period lasted for about 100 years. Solomon's sons didn't do such a good job and they ended up causing a civil war that divided the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel. And it became a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is known as what? Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. And we learned that Amos was from Judah, but he was sent to Israel. Now, part of the context here is understanding what was going on in Israel during this time period. And Israel was experiencing a great amount of affluency and prosperity. They actually were having a lot of peace with surrounding nations at this particular time as well. So it was a height of prosperity, but it was also the height of spiritual idolatry and injustice in the nation. And so that's the context for which uh, Amos comes from Judah to Israel. Now, what do we know about Amos? Well, we know that Amos was from Judah, Tekoa. We also know that, what does his name mean? Does anybody remember what his name means? Burden bearer, right. We just saw that in in the opening video as well. He had this burden of God's judgment to take to the nation of Israel. What did Amos do for a living? He was a fig farmer and a shepherd, right. We learned that last week as well. Chapter one, verse one talks about being a shepherd, but we also learned that he was a fig farmer. But what's fascinating about Amos is his call because you see, Amos had no formal training. He never graduated from the school of prophets. In fact, if you flip over, hopefully you've got your Bible or your device that you can uh, follow along as we go through our, our study this morning. But if you flip over to Amos chapter seven, Amos chapter seven, we have a chance to see God's call on Amos. And it's fascinating, it's just two verses, and we'll look at this in more detail when we get to chapter seven, but it's important for us to see where Amos comes from. So beginning in verse 14 of chapter seven, then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now do you think Amos saw this call coming? Absolutely, absolutely not. Here he is just kind of doing his own thing. He's got his own business. He, you know, he's a, he's a fig farmer. He's a herdsman. Uh, he's got his, his, his sheep. All this is going pretty well for him. And all of a sudden, God, almost seemingly out of nowhere, calls him to go to the nation of Israel and to prophesy, to bring this message from God. And it's a great reminder that God can use anybody for anything. If you think God's calling you to something you can't do, no, if God's calling you, He'll give you what you need. He'll equip you to what he's called you to do. One other thing I wanna mention that we really didn't talk about, but we touched on last week. We, we talk about Amos as being a minor prophet. And you know, what does that mean? We've got minor prophets and major prophets. Are the minor prophets the ones that just weren't quite good enough to make it to major league status? You know, they didn't quite make it to the big leagues. You know, if you're thinking baseball, that might be your, your thought. What is a minor prophet versus a major prophet? Well, it has nothing to do with how good of a prophet they were. You know, they weren't banished to the minor leagues for all of history. That's not the case at all. 
The, the, the distinction between a minor prophet and a major prophet is simply the length of the content that they produced, that they wrote down, that, they, that we have record of in our scripture. There are four major prophets and there are 12 minor prophets. And here's the most important thing to remember, that they are of equal importance. Just because they have minor in front of the word doesn't mean they're less important. Amos is just as important as Daniel. Obadiah is just important as Ezekiel. They're all of equal importance. So minor just means they don't have, their, their, their books were shorter. In fact, Isaiah has 66 chapters in his book. That is almost as many chapters as comprise all 12 of the minor prophets. So you get a sense of the scope of just the content and how much was in there. All right, so let's, uh, let's dive into our text and we're gonna begin in verse two. I'm gonna scoot this up just a little bit so I can be closer to you guys. Uh, begin in verse two and, and this is what I'm entitling the lion roars. And this is almost a, a verse that's a standalone verse. It's not necessarily connected with verse one, not necessarily connected with verse three, but it's, a, it's more of a contextual verse that sets the tone and the theme for the whole book of Amos. Look what it says. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastors of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. So here he's giving us some more, uh, some theme, some, con some context, some of the tone for the book of Amos. And when you think about a lion roaring and and, and I'm not gonna do a, a lion roar for you. I wish I could do a really good lion roar. Arr, no, I couldn't do it. Did you know a lion's roar can carry up to five miles? And so this, this depiction of a lion roaring is, is really a good visual, not only for the original hearers in Amos day, but for us today to understand that this is, this is an vengeful God about to display his judgment and punishment and wrath on sin. And that really is the theme of the book of Amos. And if you look, where's the source of that roar coming from in verse, one, uh, verse two? It says, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. It's coming from Jerusalem, not from the false temples there in the northern kingdom, but from Jerusalem. Now, move on down to point number two, and we're gonna begin looking in verse three of chapter one all the way to verse three of chapter two. And this is the bulk of our passage this morning, God's judgment on the six Gentile nations. Now, have you ever had this situation where you're in a room with a few other people and all of a sudden one person in the room begins to point out some of the shortcomings of another person in the room? And you're kind of taken back at first by this, but man, they're pretty honest about this and they're pointing out some shortcomings and, and as they're doing them, you're realizing, well, yeah, these are actually true. And, and all of a sudden you find yourself kind of, uh, you know, emotionally encouraging them in some way, like, yeah, this is good stuff until they now turn to you and start pointing out some of your own shortcomings. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't about me, this is about them. Now, I can remember growing up, I have a brother, and uh, oftentimes we'd be sitting in the room and, and mom or dad would walk in and, and they would start getting on my, my younger brother for something he had done, and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was all good as long as they're focused on him, but as soon as the focus came to me, it's like, whoa, 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 this is about my brother, not me. And we all have that, but. It, it, it's somewhat of what we're gonna see in our study today where Amos, remember he's from Judah, a foreigner in a sense, coming up to Israel, and he's got this message about the nations that surround Israel. And I'm sure those Israelites, as they're hearing this message about God's judgment, about all these nations that, that surround them, they're like, yeah, this, this, this guy from, from Judah is not half bad. He's got a great message. Preach it, Amos, preach it. But as we'll see next week, as the message continued, it quit talking about the Gentile nations and it started talking about Judah to their south and then ultimately within their own borders began to talk about them, Israel. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 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 Amos. <laughs> it was good up until that point. And so in some ways, the passage we're looking at today, God's judgment on these six Gentile nations is really somewhat of a setup for what's coming next week when we look at the last two nations that Amos brings his judgment on. Let's get some geographical context. I have a map. Last week, Pastor Russell had a map showing the divided kingdom, the north and the south. Well, I've got a map that'll show where these six Gentile nations are. So if you see these, we're gonna go in the order they're gonna be presented to us. So you start up in the northeast, the green one, the kingdom of Aram, and that's the city of Damascus or the nation state of Syria. The next one, he's gonna come southwest down to the red one, to Gaza, and that's Philistia, or the home of the Philistines. Go straight up to the northwest, and you get to Tyre. We'll mention Tyre, and that's part of the Phoenician state. Come straight south to the big yellow nation. That's the kingdom of Edom. 
Then he's going to go up to the kingdom of Ammon and then down to the kingdom of Moab. So those are the six. And notice how they all surround Israel and Judah. There's hardly a border that's not connected with one of these six Gentile nations that he's going to be addressing in this. So it helps us understand where these are as we're looking at them. Now, letter A, the opening formula. What I've done here is all six of these that we're gonna look at have a lot of commonality, especially the first opening phrases. They're gonna be exactly the same. And so instead of waiting till we get to each one, I'm gonna go ahead and just talk about these three key phrases before we get to them. The first one, and we'll use it in, in verse three, it starts with, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Now, Amos may not have been formally trained. He might not have been a graduate of the school of prophets, but he was smart enough to know to lead with thus says the Lord, thus says God, because he knew that he was taking a pretty unpopular message to Israel. And it wasn't all gonna be, they weren't all gonna be excited about the whole message. And so he leads with this is what God says. He understood the source of his authority was not himself. He was just a messenger. It was God that was the source of authority. And boy, is this important for us today, that when we teach or preach, that we lead with God's word. This is what God says. Not only do we lead with it, but we lean into it. It's not important what I say. My ideas and thoughts, not important. What God thinks and what God says, very important, life-changing. The next phrase we see here is this idea of, uh, it's, a, it's a figure of speech, for three transgressions of and for four. Now, if you're looking at an outline, there's a blank and you're thinking, oh, are we bringing blanks back? No, that's just to insert one of the names of one of the, the nations that he's judging here. So we see in verse, verse three, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. Now, what does that mean? What does this figure of speech mean? Well, what, what Amos was doing was saying, all right, there have been a lot of other things you've done wrong. Uh, and if it's literal, it's, it's three, but it's probably meaning there's been a, a long list of, of crimes that you've committed, but now you have reached the fourth one and now you will receive God's just punishment on the fourth. That's the fourth transgression. That's why I entitled the message, the fourth transgression. And what we see here is that God did not bring judgment on the first transgression, or the second transgression, or even the third transgression, or perhaps a whole bunch more, but there was a point where God brought judgment and punishment. And so this is a great reminder here that, that God is a God of mercy and grace and patience. He did not bring the punishment on the first, second, or third sin. We'll talk more about that later. The third phrase we see in all six of these is this phrase, I will not revoke the punishment. You see, God cannot revoke the punishment of sin. He can delay it, amen? He can delay it, but he cannot revoke it. Sin must always be paid for. And we talk a lot about this from this pulpit, that God is a holy and righteous God, and he has a holy and righteous standard, and he must judge sin. He cannot allow sin to go unpunished. That would be against his very character, and because of who God is and because of who I know I am to be a sinner, I deserve nothing more than hell itself. And apart from Jesus Christ saving work in my life, that's exactly where I would be headed. So those are the three phrases we're gonna see in all of these. For three transgressions and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. And then he starts with, thus saith the Lord. So now let's look at these indictments and judgments that we're gonna see. And we're gonna go pretty quick through these six. But let's look at these six indictments. Number one is Damascus or the nation state of Syria. And we see this in verse three and five. What's the indictment he brings against them? And it always leads with the word because. So if you find the word because in verse three, that will set up the indictment. Because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Now, what is threshing sledges of iron? And what is being threshed? What is that? He's talking about farming here. And in farming, to thresh would mean to separate the wheat from the chaff, the stalk from the grain. And to do that, they would go out and they would harvest the fields and they would bring the harvest into what they would call the threshing floor. And they would lay all of their, all of their wheat down on this threshing floor in, in layers. And they would get these threshing sleds or sledges. And they would be pretty large pieces of wood that they would put together, maybe four or five feet wide by six or seven feet 
tall, and they would lay them flat, but on one side, the bottom side, it would have these sharp rocks, or in this case, sharp pieces of iron that would be embedded in that sled. And that sled would be pulled by an oxen around in a circle on the threshing floor, uh, the threshing floor, sleshing floor, uh, the threshing floor, and it would begin to separate the wheat from the chaff, the stalk from the, the grain. And it was a modern day farm machine for them that would save them a whole bunch of time. And so he is de developing this picture of what it would be like of putting that on human beings and whether that was little, literal or metaphorically. We are not sure, but either way, he's talking about a brutal slaughter of human beings. And so what's their judgment? Look on in verse four. And so I will send fire. You're gonna see fire in all six of these judgments, punishments. And then I will also devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. That also, that devour strongholds, fire and devour the strongholds in all six of these. We're gonna see that. So basically, the city's gonna be destroyed and burned. That's the judgment. And then also, look what else he says. He goes on and he says, I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon. And him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden and the people of Syria shall go into exile into care, most likely into Assyria. So not only would they destroy these cities, but the people would be exiled as well. What's the takeaway from this first one? Stop treating people like things. They were literally, in a very barbaric way, treating people like things. Whether they were literally putting those, those, those threshing sledges on top of people and dragging them, or doing something else that was just as barbaric. They were treating people just like wheat, like things. Number two, Gaza. Then he travels down to the, uh, to the southwest, to Gaza, or where the Philistines called home. The indictment here in verse six, because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. Now what does that mean? What did they do? Were they taking prisoners of war? No, the, the language he uses is different. This is not taking, uh, you know, in wartime taking prisoners. No, it's talking about taking up innocent people and basically selling them for a profit to another country. It's basically slave trading is what they were doing. And that's what they were being indicted for, the taking of innocent people and treating them like cattle, like a commodity. What's the judgment? Once again, we see cities burned and destroyed. Ultimately, in this situation, no one would survive. If you look all the way to the end of uh, verse eight, it says, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. The third one, verses nine through 10, talking now about the city-state of Tyre, which is part of the nation-state of Phoenicia. What was their indictment? It says in verse 11, nope, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 11. Because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, and his anger toward perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. The indictment here is a revengeful spirit, a persistent hatred toward another country. But who's he talking about here? This is interesting because uh, he, he, he mentions, delivered, um, uh, pursued his brother with the sword. Who's he talking about? Well, it's important to understand Edom is a descendant of Esau. Israel is a descendant of who? Jacob. Were Jacob and Esau related? Yeah, and they were, they were just great buds and they were great brothers, weren't they? They just loved each other and got along so well? No, no, absolutely not. In fact, anything but that. From the very beginning, there was, there was a rivalry and bitterness and resentfulness and scheming uh, between those two. And it continued on now even until we have these two nations. We have Edom and Israel. And so now when you read that and you say, when you see the, the indictment, because they... Uh, he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. That's this jealousy, this rivalry that Edom had toward Israel. What was the judgment? It was gonna be fire and devastation of two specific cities. The takeaway, jealousy and hatred will destroy you. Now we move to the, the fifth one, Ammon. In verse 13, we see the uh, indictment. Because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead, that they might enlarge their borders. I get to this one and I just get this, this sinking feeling in my stomach of, of how atrocious and barbaric this particular act was that the Ammonites were committing against pregnant women in Gilead. It was a violent crime against a helpless or very vulnerable human being. And what was the purpose for doing it? To enlarge their borders, 
to have more space, to have more land, to have more profit, to have more material gain. That's why they were doing this terrible, terrible thing. What was the judgment? Once again, fire and devastation, storms, and in this case, the king and his court were exiled. But here's an important takeaway on this, and it's so important for us today, that we value and protect life, all of life from conception until death, that we value that, particularly the helpless and the most vulnerable, that we value and protect life. And it's one thing to say, I am a big supporter of life, but what are we doing about protecting those that are most vulnerable, those that are most helpless around us? Number six, Moab. Now we're down into chapter two, verse one. Because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. He burned the bones of king of Edom. I don't fully understand what's going on here. I understand a little bit, but I, I'll tell you what the, the heart matter here is. They had, a, they had the Moab had a revengeful spirit toward, the, toward Edom, uh, and especially their king. Whether they dug up the, the dead king's bones to burn him, or it was after they had killed him that they burned his bones. And by the way, they would burn bones for the purpose of getting the, the lime from those bones, and they would actually use it to, to pl plaster in their walls. And so perhaps the king of Moab wanted to plaster his walls with the bones of the king of Edom, and so that's why he was doing this, as a revengeful act. I know it sounds kind of gruesome. And by the way, he's not talking about uh, saying it's wrong for respectful cremation. That's not what he's dealing with. He's talking about uh, this spirit of exacting revenge and even profiting from it. Now, as we look at all six of these indictments, at the center of all six of these indictments, we see the sin of selfishness. The sin of selfishness that's carried to its logical extreme. Because you think, you know, aren't we all a little selfish? Yeah, we are. But what happens if that, that sin of selfishness continues on? What if we start, you know, okay, what can I profit? Oh, wait, I can get more. Well, I might hurt somebody, but I'll get more. And we become conflicted, and all of a sudden, the profit wins out over hurting somebody. We begin to treat people like things. We're more concerned with profit. We stop valuing human life in general. And so that's what, that's what God is indicting these six Gentile nations. He's not dealing with their worship of false gods. He's dealing with how they're treating one another. So what is Amos teaching us? This is Roman numeral three on your outline. What is Amos teaching us? I'm gonna give you just several things. First of all, God is sovereign over the nations. God is sovereign over the nations. Last week, Pastor Russell gave us several themes, and one of those themes was an all-powerful uh, all creator. And this is exactly supporting that overarching theme of the book of Amos. You see, Amos understood that God was the God over all the nations. Israel tended to think God, Yahweh, was their God, more of a nationalistic God that would strike out against other nations on their behalf. But no, Amos understood that God was the God of all the nations. He was sovereign over all the nations. And Israel needed to be reminded of that, just like we need to be reminded of that occasionally. Right now, especially, we need to be reminded of that. We, we live in a, in a very crazy time in our world today. There's a lot of things going on all around our world, not just in our own nation, but all around the world. And it's great to be reminded, God is sovereign over all the nations and he still directs the affairs of man. That can be a great comfort for all of us. Paul put it this way in Colossians 1, 16 through 17. He said this, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is sovereign over the nations. The next thing we can take away from this is that we are all sinners. We are all sinners. Now, I know you're thinking, well, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, we, we know that. But let, follow with me for just a minute. Because Amos is bringing a message to the Israelites there in the northern kingdom. And he's talking first about the judgment on these six Gentile nations. But he's going to get to, as we'll see next week, Judah and Israel and their sin. We understand that Judah and Israel can be guilty of sin because they had received the law. They had the prophets of God. But those Gentile nations had not received the law of God. They had not had the prophets of God sent to them. How could Amos declare them guilty of these sins as well? Well, I'll tell you how. Because what they did, they should know themselves to be guilty of wrongdoing. They knew themselves guilty. This is really a matter of conscience. 
The Bible makes this point often, that the law of God is written on the heart of every man. And if you've never really thought about that, I would encourage you to take some time studying chapter one and two of the book of Romans. Because throughout there, we get this idea that God has written his law on the hearts of every person. Let me just read one verse or two verses from Romans chapter two that that really bring this home. Romans chapter two, verse 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Man knows, at least in general, the obligation he bears to other human beings. And a good way of looking at this, I I was thinking about this, those Gentile nations, if what they were doing to other nations, if another nation came and did that to their people or their family, they would be quick to say, that's wrong. We know what's right and wrong. God has written that in our hearts. It's in our conscience. And so Amos indicts him as guilty, much like Paul does in Romans 3.23 when he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone, everyone needs God's grace because everyone has offended God. Everyone needs God's grace because everyone has offended God. The next thing we can pull from this is God must judge and punish sin. One of the themes that Russell brought up last week was the wrathful God. And and by the way, (laughs) we're gonna see a lot of wrath. We're gonna see a lot of judgment. I love our our subtitle for this, uh, the book of Amos. It's it's judgment and restoration. And I was thinking about that this weekend. I thought, well, it's 99% judgment. And then at the very end of the the, the whole book, we get a little restoration. So it's, it's, it's a lot of judgment. Uh, but it's important for us to, to, to hear that and to, and to know that. And it's important for us as even as Christians to be reminded that God is equally love and justice. And the fear of God is not just for the unbeliever, but it's for the believer as well. Because yes, God's wrath for my sin was satisfied by Jesus' blood that was shed at Calvary. But the wrath of a sin-hating God must remain in my consciousness. It must stay there. And here's why. Because it keeps me from taking my salvation for granted. It keeps me from taking my salvation for granted. It helps me stay focused on putting on the righteousness of Christ each and every day in my life. It reminds me of the fact that I'm called to be an ambassador of the gospel to a very dark and sinful world. So it's important for us as believers, but boy, is it important for unbelievers to be reminded about that. You see, the Gentile nations here in Amos, they had continued in their unrepentant lifestyle of sin and injustice over and over and over and over, and ultimately they suffered God's righteous judgment and wrath. The same thing for all of us. We are all sinners. We too will experience that same punishment and judgment and wrath. Paul makes it clear in Romans 2, chapter five. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's the bad news, but there's some good news in there. There's, there's, a, there's, some, there's some glimmers of good news in what we're looking at here. And it starts here, when we, when we look at Amos, that God is patient in bringing his judgment. God is patient in bringing his judgment. As I said, we're gonna talk a lot about judgment and wrath over the, these next uh, couple of months, um, nine chapters of that. But as we go through that, please keep your eyes wide open to see Glimpses of God's amazing grace, God's amazing mercy, God's amazing patience. Specifically, today, we see that in that phrase. Remember the phrase we looked at earlier? For three transgressions, for three transgressions, there was no rush to judgment on God's part. He waits until every opportunity has been extended for repentance. And this is still true today. And the purpose of God's patience, remember we said he cannot revoke his punishment, but he can delay that. And the reason for God's patience is for repentance, that each person would have every opportunity extended to them to repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Christ. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Man is sinful, repentance. 
God must judge that sin and punish that sin. Thankful that God has been patient and merciful in, in, in delivering that punishment. But boy, do we need a savior. This all points to Calvary. This all points to the need of God bringing and sending a savior for the sins of mankind. If this idea that we are all sinners is kind of new to you, my prayer this morning would be that you would recognize the fact that you are a sinner in need of a savior and that you in fact will be judged by a holy God who can't revoke his punishment. He cannot revoke his wrath of what you deserve. But at the same time, that holy God has also sent a savior, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, to take the punishment that we deserve. Remember, he can't revoke the punishment. Somebody's gotta take the punishment. Jesus Christ coming into this world, living a perfect sinless life so that he in fact could go to the cross and take that punishment that God could not revoke on our behalf. Amen to that, that God sent Jesus. Boy, do we need a savior. We're gonna move now to a time of response. And if you are in need of a savior, which we really all are in need of a savior, right? But maybe you're in need of a savior for salvation because you are outside of Christ. I pray that this morning as we sing, we have the opportunity to reflect on the truth of God's word. And perhaps you would begin that process of exploring as God's Holy Spirit begins to draw you to him. And for those of us in Christ, we'll be reminded of the great wrath of God that we have been spared because of Christ's atoning work. And that will motivate us to want to live lives of righteousness. We want to put on Christ's righteousness. We'll want to be ambassadors of the gospel as we live for him.